Hi, and thanks for hitting the snooze button. I'm Neil Headley. I was prepared to write off a literal lifelong battle with insomnia as just being part of spending more than 30 years in morning television and radio. Well, when I dug a little deeper, it turned out I had a lot more to learn. So in this series, we try to help fix your sleep by figuring out why mine is so horribly broken. And maybe we can stumble upon some answers together. Later in the show, my friend Dr. Michael Grandner is back from the University of Arizona to cover some pretty compelling new developments in sleep science. But first, I want to introduce you to Dr. Michael Chi. He's a professor at the Young Lu Lin School of Medicine at the National University of Singapore and the director of its Center for Sleep and Cognition. Now, he's been a vigorous advocate for sleep as a modifiable health risk factor. He's done a ton of TV and radio. He's received the National Outstanding Clinician Scientist Award. In addition to being a three-time recipient of the Star Investigator Award, he put Singapore on the map, basically, in the field of cognitive neuroscience and sleep and human brain mapping. And he's trained a ton of young scientists who've gone on to have successful careers. So here's my friend, Dr. Michael Chi. Okay, here we go. Well, Michael, everybody that's ever been on the show gets the same first question, whether they are a head of state, whether they are the uh, lead guitarist of a rock band, whether they are a world-class neuroscientist. And that question is this, how did you sleep last night? Sort of okay. I, I, would, I would have loved to have slept a little bit more, con- more quickly, but I'm pretty well rested. Otherwise, I wouldn't be uh, talking to you. Okay, yes, because uh, you are 12 hours ahead of me. So yes, early in the morning for you, late at night for me. So on on a night where sleep doesn't show up for you, do you have a thing that you do that that more often than not works? It happens uh, more frequently as I get I get older, but I, I just try to relax and just think of things that are pleasant. Sometimes I will play um, a recording. Sometimes uh, lectures are good to put you to sleep, actually. <laughs> they are. No offense uh, to the lecturer, of course. No, no. Sometimes if you hear a rehearsing of your own talk or something like that, that puts you to sleep. It happens in the afternoon a little bit, but I find that if I, if I watch, say, a clay court tennis match where the, the sound is very rhythmic and, you know, the action is not super dramatic, that also can help. <laughs> Oh. Although I won't try that at night. Yes. I'm always fascinated to hear the answers of the professionals because they they are uh, far ranging, except the one thing that people seem to agree on more often than not is doing something that gets them out of bed if they're having trouble falling asleep. Yeah, that's that's the classic sleep hygiene advice. I tend not to follow it for whatever reason, but yeah. That's no, it's good. It's good finding out that even the people who do sleep stuff for a living don't always follow the rules. That's good. So I, I'm intrigued by the work that you've been doing with wearable sleep trackers, particularly Fitbits, because for people who know anything about this project, my intent at the outset was to try various things that people are going to recommend to me along the way. And my intent at the beginning was to track whether or not there is a measurable difference in the quality of my sleep as reported by, well, now it's a Fitbit Versa 2. And it was intriguing because the more people I talked to, the more people I realized were quoting research that you have done or that you have directly been a part of into wearable technology and Fitbits and their accuracy in terms of tracking our sleep. And so I figured rather than continue talking to a bunch of people who are going to quote you, I'll just talk to you and eliminate the middleman. So let's let's talk about i mean not necessarily the versa 2 but either fitbits in general or even even broader than that wearables in ge- how accurate is this thing on my what's it good for okay i want to start by addressing something you said at the start of this little question that you were you are using the fitbit to track your sleep quality now that can be used loosely as a mean quality and duration Sleep quality is actually a separate construct that is your subjective. When you ask, first ask me, how did you sleep? I said, well, okay, duration wise, it was about my average last night. Quality wise, you know, is uh, relates to how well rested you feel, 
how energetic you feel when you get up in the morning. And that itself is an independent predictor of um, outcomes. It's much harder to um, quantify and to uh, write about because it is subjective. But there are some studies that show that it materially affects outcomes as in health and well-being outcomes. Now, the, these wearables can't actually measure that. Uh, they measure sleep duration, the efficiency of sleep, the continuity of sleep. Now, insofar as accuracy in terms of those measurements goes, I think that the wearable devices, the Fitbit's about the best in the market right now in terms of reliability. In terms of accuracy that is compared to the gold standard, the PSG, they, are, they will measure either more sleep or less sleep depending on the, on the group that you test. Now, in most of the work done stateside, like from people like Vizambotti, seem to find that the consumer wearables tend to overestimate sleep. Now, here in Asia, particularly in the uh, group that I've had the most experience testing is, is adolescents, um, these devices tend to underestimate sleep. And it's the underestimate is about 30 minutes for an eight hour uh, sleep period. So the value of these devices is not so much the timing accuracy. So minute for minute, if you're going for that, you're probably not making the best use of the device. How I would use these devices is that what we have found is uh, in multi-night studies on adolescents that the, the trend that is, if you if it says you sleep six and a half hours, actually the PSG says seven. The trend is quite faithful to what the polysomnography or PSG, the gold standard, measures, and I think that's what users should focus on: is my sleep overall regular? Is it you know, um, is it consistent in terms of the duration that I'm trying to shoot for? So if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is, at least in, in the case that you cited, they're off by half an hour, but they're always off by half an hour. So the yeah. trend... Well, they, they, they can be off by half an hour. The, the, the offset depends on, I think, the age group as well as maybe some, there might be some ethnicity considerations as well. We're looking into that right now. But the point is the trend data uh, is fairly reliable. So that's that's what I would hang my hat on. So let me punch up my numbers from last night on my Fitbit and I'll just throw them at you and 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 we'll have some fun at my expense. So rough night last night, the baby, we have a two year old and she had kind of a rough night last night and it's up to me to have the baby monitor on in my room. So my Fitbit tells me that I had four hours and 24 minutes asleep 39 minutes awake out of that four hours and 24 minutes of sleep there was 32 minutes of deep sleep and six percent REM how much of that is means anything in your experience testing these devices how much of that data is actually relevant and I can you know as we say take it to the bank okay I, I think at present the total sleep time as I mentioned could be subject to an offset but it, the trend analysis is quite, I would trust it. And if you're showing night to night uh, changes, I would tend to trust that. It can be off sometimes, but generally it's reliable. In terms of the sleep staging, I think that's still a work in progress. They are compared to the last generation technology where we only could guess sleep stages. In fact, the, the manufacturers didn't even try to guess sleep stages based on just motion alone, the um, new generation, and I'll say just maybe the last three, four years or so, manufacturers have been trying to integrate heart rate, heart rate variability, um, even breathing data, uh, or even temperature data into their algorithms. It's still a work in progress, I think. I wouldn't totally trust those readings, but they're getting, they're getting better over time. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about the heart rate data because one of the other things that it tells me about my sleep last night was that my sleeping heart rate was 60. And so for 90% of the night, 
my sleeping heart rate was above my resting heart rate. It, I'm, I'm looking at my sleep graph and it, it dips below my, because my resting is 56 and it dips below that 56 a couple of times, but not very much. And like I said, last night was a, was a rough night. So, so the heart rate stuff, I assume, because people kind of depend on these as heart rate. I mean, these were heart rate monitors probably first and then step counters and all kinds of other things as the technology advanced. So I, I can probably count on for whatever I want to take from it, that heart rate data as well while I was asleep, right? Again, it really depends on the demographic. So I presume you would be in the demographic where it's likely to be quite reliable. In older persons, what we've found is that some of the some of uh, people above 60, 70, if they don't strap on the device well, or the, for whatever reason, they have some issues with skin contact, the sensor doesn't read well. So the heart rate is measured by a technology called PPG or photoplethysmography. And that involves shining um, a light in the case of Fitbits and most other de- uh, most of these devices is a green light, green wavelength light. And it that light bounces on the skin. It sort of uh, detects the um, pulsations of the blood vessels underlying the skin. Now, if for whatever reason the contact is bad or the, the sensor doesn't pick up the skin, blood vessels, then you have an issue with the accuracy. But overall, I presume that you being young and generally healthy, that's a reasonable measure. And as you insinuated, your rough night was contributed by the fact that um, you have a ba- young baby who has probably kept you up and, also, and that could cause some excitement, which will certainly drive up your heart rate. So normally, if you have a very good night of uh, sleep, the heart rate has a sort of a bow-shaped pattern. It, it's, it is close to your resting heart rate at the time you fall asleep or slightly higher, and then it dips sort of uh, in the middle of the night, hit, hitting a low at around the midpoint of sleep or you know, slightly earlier later. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so it must be maddening for someone like you who studies all of this data close up. And I mean, as I said earlier, so much of the conversation in sleep science revolving around wearables, so much of it quotes from research that you have done. When you hear about things like orthosomnia, which is, in case you're listening and it's a term that you haven't run into before, I'm sure Michael knows it, it's that idea where you get so obsessed with the data from your sleep tracker that it actually causes insomnia. And for you, Michael, that must be especially frustrating when you know that people are tracking things on their on their wearables that probably aren't very accurate to begin with. Well, I wouldn't say that the, the data from the wear, wearables is inaccurate, uh, but I would say that autosomnia can be a problem if you obsess uh, excessively over measuring health and well-being. I think people should just accept that, well, if, if you sleep well on most nights and have the odd poor night, you shouldn't be too worried about it. You shouldn't be too worried about it. Your body will sort of make up for it. Perhaps the advice I'd give is that if you can, try to avoid doing a mission critical task on the nights following those where you have had really poor sleep because you, you know, where you can, you want to try to avoid making um, bad decisions in, you know, imprudent decisions, you know, hasty decisions because you were in a bad mood because you didn't have good sleep. As for autosomnia, the, the kind of anxieties or concerns one gets from, you know, just, just being, anxious about what you measure and finding that it's not up to what you expected. Well, even sleep professionals, I mean, I get it now and then, but I have to just remind myself, hey, look, you know, you, you can take one or two bad nights at a go, but just strive um, for what you can do. Is there evidence, and and this may be beyond the scope of, of work that you've been doing, but is there evidence that suggests that maybe it's because we're wearing it on our wrists that might be contributing to the inaccuracy? For example, you know, they've, there's this headband out there, the Dream or the Dream 2, I guess, is the latest iteration, which – would lead one to believe that because it looks a lot more like all the electrodes that get strapped to your head once you go for PSG testing, that maybe it has a shot at being more accurate. But is there data to 
to suggest that where we're wearing our sleep trackers is contributing to whatever the level of accuracy might be or might not be? Okay, so that's uh, there are two parts to the, answering this uh, question. Firstly, it's what the user will uh, prefers or tolerates, and secondly, the um, actual fidelity of the the device. Okay, so first the um, user factor. In my group alone, my lab, you know, with over twenty people and a bigger group, maybe thirty odd people who uh, have experience wearing these devices because we have a lot of them. There's quite a bit of variation. Some people are happy with wearing uh, something at the wrist. Some people absolutely do not like wearing a wrist-worn device at night when they sleep because they, they take off their watches anyway when they sleep. And for them, the Aura ring, which is something you wear on the fingers, any of them, is more acceptable. So that's an alternative. So the Aura uses pretty much the same technology as a Fitbit, it's got a multi-axis motion sensor. It's got something that detects the the pulse, but using a different wavelength. And it's got a temperature sensor. So it's pretty much the same technology as a Fitbit, but on the tiny form factor on, on the finger. And then you mentioned the Dream. The Dream measures EG, which is the gold standard. And it also measures motion and, and heart rate and, and breathing. How it integrates those signals, I'm not clear. It doesn't always use a pure EEG signal from what I can see. I haven't done, or my group hasn't done a head-to-head -head comparison between the Dream and the PSG. But my anecdotal use suggests that if you can tolerate it, it is probably a, a bit more accurate than the, 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 uh, the other two types of wearables. But a good number of people don't like wearing things on the head at night when they sleep. Also, there is the issue of keeping the bands on your head. I think with Dream, it's a comfortable device, but sometimes it, it comes off or it's uh, misplaced so that the actual EG recordings don't have the fidelity that you would really like for accurate measurements. But overall, I think it, it performs you know, a wee bit better. It's also a lot more expensive. So that's a, another consideration. So for a person who tosses and turns a lot in their sleep, the dream might be a less attractive option and you might want to go with, for example, the ring or the Fitbit. But if you're a person who doesn't move very much, perhaps when you're sleeping, I, I, that's, that's fascinating. I, I never stopped to think about whether or not stuff comes loose or comes off while you're, while you're asleep. And that's instructive going forward as well, because I mean, I, got into all of this because according to my friend Mark Bulas at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto, I have a periodic limb movement index of 82. Mm. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the response. I, I mean, it used to be an 82. Then he put me on Mirapex and knocked it down to a one. So there was that and there, there was that improvement. So for me, a dream probably would have been out of the uh, out of the realm of possibility right away because I was flopping around like I was a fish on the bottom of the deck of a boat. It was just not a pretty thing. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind going forward when I think about what my next wearable purchase is going to be. Where, do, How close do you think we are, Michael, to having technology that we can use at home that approximates PSG in terms of accuracy, not just for sleep duration, but for sleep staging as well? Okay, that's a really interesting question, which we are interested in answering. I mean, the fundamentally, we're talking about, you know, a bit about apples and oranges here, both are fruit, but they, they, you know, they're sort of different types of fruit. So the PSG measures sleep. It's, it's largely centered on the use of electrical signals from the brain, the EEG. And um, this itself is a measure of the neural activity in the brain. Now, all the other peripheral signals, motion, heartbeat, heartbeat variability, and then respiration. These are all also a result of output from the, the nervous system. It's just, you know, not the central nervous system, but more from the autonomic nervous system. But they are all reflections of, of the brain and it's how it's behaving. So I think that the, the key advantage of wearables is that 
you can use them night in, night out, pretty much all the time. It's just not feasible to use、uh, PSG in its in its original form to measure sleep over hundreds of nights. So I think the answer it's an exciting period we're at. The as the technology evolves in terms of the sensors, as it evolves in terms of the algorithms and how they are tuned to different age groups, different demographics in terms of maybe ethnicity or gender. The so-called sleep trackers will get better and better at measuring at sleep. At the same time, our conceptualization of what we should measure and、uh, how these measures inform about health and well-being will continue to evolve. I believe, as people, researchers included, realize that sometimes you know having access to a lot of、uh, data over a long period of time. Can provide insights that a few very high quality measures measurements、uh, in highly controlled conditions don't. So I think this is a really、um, exciting time for researchers and people interested in sleep in general, and that we should you know just watch how things、uh, develop. Michael, I appreciate you having time to to help navigate some of this because it's frustrating for me when I see so many people on、uh, you know Reddit or Facebook or wherever they happen to gather who are I, I mean they're they are probably textbook examples of orthosomnia because they'll jump into a a, a group on Facebook or something like that and they'll say, well, my Fitbit says that I had eleven percent deep sleep last night and I'm I'm in a panic because it should be at least fifteen or twenty and I don't know what to do and and I think about people like you who are doing the research into what they really accurately can track and and. I'm grateful that、uh, you had some time to sort of clear away some of the haze for us, so that we we know we know what we're buying a little bit better. So I appreciate the time. Yeah, good. I'm I'm happy to、uh, contribute some of this information. I think your last、uh, point is is extremely important. People shouldn't obsess with with you know raw numbers. I think there is also something to say of you know doing your own internal correlation between what is measured. And your, you know, your subjective sense of sleep quality, right? So, I actually would pay attention to the trend of, you know, how you perceive your subjective sleep quality. If you feel that you're well rested, you're energetic, you know, I, I would pay a little,、uh, you know, I would, I would either upweight or downweight the information I'm getting from the devices. They're meant as a tool to help you, so think about it that way. They're not a, don't think of it as something that will chain you to a set of measurements, because I think that's. That's sad, you know. It's not making use of the opportunity that lies before you. There you go, Doctor Michael Chi on the Snooze Button podcast. Links to a bunch of Michael's stuff in the show notes and on our website at thesnoozebutton dot com. Now、uh, let's get an update on what else is going on in the world of sleep science with our friend Doctor Michael Grandner from the University of Arizona. I feel like it's been a while since I've asked you this question, so I feel like just for the、yeah. sake of catching up, I should ask you: How did you sleep last night? I, I slept great. I, if you, I usually do, and I don't say that in a braggy way. It's just every once in a while I don't, but that's because I'm a human being. But usually I do. Last night was no major exception. Last night was pretty normal. Nice. Okay. Good. So as we do, we get Michael.、Uh, whenever our schedules align, we bring Michael on to talk about what big things are on his radar in the sleep world. And of course, we're right on the cusp of this now virtual Sleep 2020 conference that's happening. And I know you're a big part of that. So talk to me about what's on your mind. Yeah, it's coming up right now. I'm still、uh, working on all our presentations. We've got our, our lab has got I don't know a couple dozen. Presentations worth the material we're working on. So the couple of posters I've been working on to, with the students to help finalize, you might find interesting. We actually have a couple of studies looking at mobile device use at night, and one of them is looking at impacts on mental health, and another one is looking at relationships with productivity. And while there's nothing I think super groundbreaking here, because we all know that if you're using mobile devices at night in general, that's probably not a great thing. But The mental health one was important because one of the things that we've noticed is in just talking to people is that a lot of people who are using a lot of devices at night, their motivations are can sometimes be around things like stress or to de-stress or 
because they're afraid of missing out on something or they get worked up on something. And so I was looking to see, all right, so how do patterns overlap between mobile device use at night and mental health? And this was this was an analysis led by one of the grad students, Brooke Mason. And one of the things that, that she found was depression scores were associated with mobile device use at night. So the people who were texting at night, using the internet at night, uh, were more likely to have higher depression scores. But just having it in the room wasn't really wasn't what was associated. It was actually, it was the texting and the internet browsing. But also the one thing, the other thing we looked at with mobile device use is this idea of unplanned awakenings, where a lot of people use their phone as an alarm. Uh, and we talk about interruptions from mobile devices being bad. But what if you planned on the interruption? So you set an alarm and the phone beeps. But then what if the phone beeps and you didn't plan it? Does that make a difference? And that was one of the things we found that for depression scores, the ones who say they have lots of unplanned awakenings have higher depression scores. That was the ones who people who check their phones in the middle of the night, not saying that one is stronger than the other it's, or that one direction is what matters. So some people might be more anxious and, and stressed. And so that's why they check their phone. Or people who are not sleeping as well will just check their phone the night because they're awake or the stress that led to the phone checking might have been what woke them up. We don't know. It's just if you're waking up in the middle of the night and the first thing you do is you check your phone, I think twice about that habit. And also, if you don't have your phone silent during the night, if you're going to have it in your room, I'd also rethink that as well. And, and she also looked at things like anxiety scores. Similarly, with social media and email and Internet having higher you, the more use uh, of those things at night in bed, the more your anxiety scores were. Same with the unplanned awakenings. And then even just overall stress associated with more of this mobile use at night. Because I have my phone on, a uh, fun little secret about my life, my phone is on <laughs> Do Not Disturb all the time. It is 24-7 on Do Not Disturb. But what I've done is I've made an exception in my phone. There's a list in my phone that if you are in my favorites list in my contacts, yep. then your texts and your phone calls make my Fitbit go off. Wife's on there. My daughter, my 16-year-old is on that list. My boss is on there from the radio station, et cetera. That's important. You're on there. It's people who I feel like if they need to get a hold of me, then they should be able to get a hold of me. But nobody else can interrupt me with anything except the people I've decided in advance. OK, you know what? If it's this person knows my life well enough to know that if it's two o'clock in the morning, I'm asleep. <laughs> don't bug me unless it's important. And if that person decides it is important, well, then I better get some kind of a notification. Maybe that's a better system for people to adopt than just automatically going to silent or something like that is making better use of that. Do not disturb feature that's built into most phones now. I, th I think that's brilliant. I think it's like whitelisting a firewall. And I think. If we do this, that's probably going to be way more normal in the future. I think we're eventually going to get to the point where we get all these notifications and where we just become numb to them, uh, where they cause problems and, and stop helping. And so maybe that's what everyone's in the future is going to do. And you will have figured it out long before everyone else. But yeah, no, I, I do the same. Not all the time with everything, but there are certain classes of notifications I just have off all the time now. Because it's Is it no weird that I've got uh, like a dozen people that are on my do not uh, on my exceptions list and you're one of them? Is that weird? What it means is it means I don't bug you too much. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, there's nothing like trusting a sleep specialist with your phone number, knowing they won't call you in the middle of the night. There's, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm safe there. Yeah. So the other, the other mobile device use one I wanted to talk about was the productivity one. So this was uh, another one of our students, Alexa Gozar. And, and so she looked at productivity because a lot of people are on their devices at night because they feel like they're more productive. They're doing stuff like that. That's a good use of time. And, and we want, I want to send the clear message. That's probably not a good use of time. And so <laughs> we basically wanted to quantify this. Like, how much is it not a good use of time? And so we also had people fill out a productivity questionnaire. Like, how, how just in their day, what are all the different things that, that interfere with their productivity? Because everyone has things that interfere with their productivity, whether it's like time demands and interpersonal stuff or whatever. So, so speaking of notifications going on, I know, seriously. So I, I just got this new laptop because my old one died and I haven't turned I haven't figured out how to turn off all these stupid notifications yet <laughs> it's, anyway, I, I'm not used to them anymore because I'm used to having them all turned off now I have to find these settings all over again no, um, the comedy timing of it was perfect we're having a conversation bemoaning notifications going off and you got a million notifications I love it 
I know because I and I usually turn them all off. I just I haven't found my way with this this new computer yet. And now that like Windows has all these like pop ups and every app now wants your attention, and so one calendar in, invite gets popped up by four different calendars. It's so annoying. It's it's that's um, why I'm in the middle of divorcing Outlook 365 this week because <laughs> it goes off too much. I know then it becomes less helpful. Speaking of less helpful, so we gave people this um, productivity questionnaire to see where are they losing productivity from. I wanted to see, are the people who are using their devices at night losing more productivity? Um, and basically, that's what we found. We found that just people who are using their phone frequently for whatever reason was associated with more productivity loss. More productivity loss is also in people who are texting, using the internet, emailing, pretty much whatever you're using it for. It's not helping your productivity. This is the take-home message from this abstract that she did. And hopefully the paper will come out soon But and people can, all these abstracts for the meeting, I think I mentioned this last time, go to sleepmeeting.org, go to the abstract supplement. You can read every single one of these. They're all out. Do um, people presume when they're checking their phone in the middle of the night, maybe because they think it increases their productivity, do they, maybe there's this false sense of I've got the blue light filter on my phone, so I'm okay. Yeah. And that's the thing where I think a good job has been done to help educate people about the blue light stuff. But I think they, they forget that's just one element of the screens. You also have this mental activation. So if you have to wind down from the thing you're using to wind down, you're using the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> like it's just, it's not serving its purpose. You want something that helps you detach and not something that you're going to then need to re-detach from. So that's my two cents on this. So like for me, I can't say I never am on any mobile device within an hour before bed, but I feel like I have a healthy relationship with it and I can put it down and I never do it in bed. Maybe for five seconds if I have to see something, but no more than that. Because only because I know it doesn't help me. It doesn't. If I know I'm going to need to do something for more than like setting an alarm or set, checking a setting or something, I'll get. I'll stand up. And 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 so this is another tip for people who are using their mobile devices. Everyone hates this, but it's extremely effective. If you feel like you need to be on your mobile device in bed to wind down, stand next to your bed when you use your device. Because first of all, after a while, you're going to want to sit back down. And when that time comes, that's your body telling you're ready. Put it down. And also, and if you don't get that signal, after a while, you're going to start feeling a little ridiculous standing there on your phone next to your bed. That's all. <laughs> yeah. That, that's your other cue. If the first one didn't kick in, this is the second one. Put it down. You're not, you're, you're now your, your body and your mind are telling you this is long enough. <laughs> um, I like that's good. There, there's also the nuclear option, and I learned this one from a, a patient, and it's brilliant. If you're someone who's really glued to your device, go into the accessibility settings and turn it on grayscale. Oh, oh, uh, that's a great idea. It's great, and it's terrible because it's a nuclear option, right? Where the idea is that a lot of the mental engagement has to do with, like, the colors and all this stuff, and you take all of that, you sap all the fun out. And all of a sudden, it becomes less addicting. So for people who have this problem, I think her idea was brilliant. And I pass it on to as many people as I could think of. But again, it is a nuclear option where it does really it does really have a big impact. But if you have really hard time putting your phone down at night, the blue light filter could also serve that to some degree if you turn it up all the way. And it and instead of like grayscale, it's more like amber scale. But but even still, you want to take away the elements that are not necessary that are just serving to keep you awake. Anyway, so th those are a couple studies I thought were really interesting that, that we've been working on. Just this idea of what do real people do and how does it actually impact the things that they care about? And, and the whole blue light at night thing isn't just about being able to sleep or not being able to sleep, which is what we usually talk about. It's also about like your mental health and your productivity and how you're doing during the day. Like it's not... It's not a good use of your time. It's not a good investment in time. I've heard someone say before, and this is obviously the extreme version of it, but it was an interesting uh, perspective, is unless you've got a meeting in the morning with the joint chiefs of staff, you don't need to be on your phone in the middle of the night. The only caveat I would have is that some people, we live in a society where some people do. Like if you're a, if, if you're a doctor on call or if you're even in the tech industry, if you're a server admin on call in the middle of the night, there might be there might it might be unavoidable but what i would do is i would challenge those industries and some of them really have and some of the, the employers really have is accept that this is a problem and don't just ignore it so for example 
if you are, if you do have to do something in the middle of the night for work, then it would be great if the employer recognized that whatever the next day is, A, you're not going to be terribly useful, and B, you're more likely to screw something up uh, by accident or hurt yourself. So maybe what they should do is have a policy where if you get woken up in the middle of the night, you get to come in a little late or something where there's some flexibility built into the system that recognizes like the truth. Either that, or if you've got a job or a career where being awake on the, on your phone in the middle of the night is normal for you, maybe you need to look at shifting your schedule and trying to kick in some kind of circadian shift where your sleep time is different. So you've been listening to us for long enough. Now. So, you, so yeah, that, that's what, that's what the circadian people have been talking about for ages, that where in the 24 hours your biological night is, is malleable. But it's not malleable from one day to the next. You can't decide, well, today I want my night to be within these hours. Like you have to gently nudge it, and but you can move it to a place where it works for you. So people who are who say, I can't go to bed until three in the morning and I can't get up until like noon, but I need to get up early for work. Like it's just a mismatch. That's a circadian rhythm disorder because there's a mismatch. We can treat that. We can move. You can move your schedule. You can shift your schedule, mostly using light and rhythms. So you can make it so that, look, if you need to be up during the night more often, you could make it so that your biological night happens in a different time. You just got to keep it consistent. And it's actually well, especially at a time now when people are getting more and more used to working from home and there's talk of companies that are just plain never going back to their offices, et cetera. <laughs> maybe those kind of conversations are easier than ever to start, because if we don't need to be in the same physical space with our coworkers anymore at the same time, then maybe it's easier to do some time shifting as far as when you clock in and clock out are concerned. I love this idea. Yeah. So employers sometimes ask me all right, I'm on board with sleep being important. What can we do at the employer level, being that we can't control what people are doing at home, or and we shouldn't, what can we do as an employer that makes us more sleep friendly? And the first thing I always say is recognize and deal with the normal variations that people have, maybe build some flexibility into schedules, maybe allow certain people to choose hours that work for them rather than what society demands for no good reason, for no reason except tradition. Don't have early meetings Monday morning. That's another one. But like this whole idea of building some flexibility into the system when it's okay. If everyone needs to work on the same assembly line at the same time, there's some inflexibility in that system. But if people are working asynchronously, there's no reason why everyone has to be on at the exact same time or for everything. Some things do, but not everything does. You bring up a really interesting point with the assembly line in particular, because I'm thinking to myself, if everybody on your assembly line has to be there at the same time, what that demonstrates to me is that there is some inefficiency that is built into your system that you have just come to accept or take as normal over the years without stopping to consider if it's actually working in your favor. I agree. I think that we've gotten to the point societally where we can start making better choices and because we know better now. Interesting. Michael, always educational, always, always a good always. time. Thanks, Thanks for bringing this to me. Yeah. And we'll talk soon. There you go, Dr. Michael Grandner on the Snooze Button Podcast. Uh, the Sleep 2020 conference is like right there. Uh, and so in the weeks to come on the show, plenty to talk about, plenty to link to, plenty of great scientists and researchers to talk to, as well as we continue together learning more about the oddly mystifying and frustrating sometimes world of sleep. So a ton of great guests coming in the next several episodes, including next week, my sleep doctor, Dr. Mark Boulos, award-winning sleep doctor, Mark Boulos from Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto is coming back on the show. It's been ages. And so we're going to have a, a, a good long chat and we're getting into a ton of great material in the weeks to come, including uh, a number of specialists and researchers talking about the importance of REM sleep. And guess what? It's it turns out it's more important than deep sleep. Yeah, that kind of upset my personal apple cart in the sleep world, too, because I thought the whole deep sleep thing was more important. But we'll write the record on that with a couple of scientists that are doing some amazing groundbreaking research into just how important REM sleep is. They are do not miss episodes. But in the meantime, head to our website, thesnoozebutton.com. I would be eternally grateful if you could just do me the tiny little favor of 
maybe tweeting out a link to this episode if you liked it or let a friend know about it or subscribe or if you like the show at all do me a favor jump on and rate the podcast there's a link on our website that makes that whole process easier you can just rate you can leave a review if you want just let other people know that it's out there that's all we can ask as we continue making this journey together until we get together next week with my friend dr mark bulos my name's neil headley hey get some sleep would you